consciousness is the starting point of reality. Completely antithetical to that attitude in science. What is reality? We're now at this great inflection. Video games and all of that is actually the most important spiritual tools we've got today. The whole point of a virtual reality is to have useful fiction of causality. The individual never gets enlightened. It's the enlightenment that becomes the individual. Space-time is doomed. Consciousness is fundamental. Einstein's theory actually predicts its own demise. Balance is not the ability to stand up, it's the ability to rise up. Please like, comment, and subscribe. So in right. your kind of, you know, life and your journey, um, are like, how are you approaching your own consciousness? Because like, you know, when, when you're exploring this field and reality and consciousness, what it is, of course, you know, you ask yourself the same questions in your own, uh, you know, uh, sense of reality and all of that. So how are you kind of playing with your own consciousness and exploring it on a more personal level? Well, yeah. So first, I'll say that there's a lot with what you said there that I agree with, and I'd like to comment on from a science point of view. But but to address your question, um, I mm. meditate, and um, for eighteen and a half years, I've I've meditated, and I meditate a lot. Uh, so I spend a lot of time, and for me, um, meditation means one thing: pure mm. silence, inner silence letting go of any conceptual systems, any thoughts whatsoever, going completely into silence. No thinking, hmm. no pictures, just hmm. the void. And um, so no special thing about positions, whatever feels comfortable, you know, no, no, um, no special things I say, just return mm. to silence. It's again in sort of the, as I mentioned earlier about the quantum computing, right? You, you have the precision and then you can't touch right. it. It's, it's absolute yeah. silence. I find that in my own life as a, as a human being, when I'm doing my science, it's, it's about moving from sloppy thinking mm. to precision. And in meditation, it's moving from sloppy thinking or precise thinking to no thinking. And what the the experience is is interesting because it's it's both exhilarating and terrifying. It's what, because the, the terrifying part is if you really let go of thoughts, in some sense you've let go of your teddy bear. Mm -hmm. You let go of your security blanket. And but that is I think part of what we've been talking about, which is if you're going to move to the next level beyond your current conceptual system, you've got to let go of your current exactly. conceptual system. And that current conceptual system is your security blanket from, from an evolutionary point of view. We're a species that builds models of our world around us. Why do we have this big hmm. frontal lobe? Well, part of it is that we're, we're sort of specialized. We're not the species that's fast or strong, we're the ones that model reality and and we run simulations in our head about what might happen. I, I walked past that cave and a bear came out and hit me last time. Maybe I should run that, maybe I shouldn't run, walk past that cave today. Maybe I can take a different mm. route. And so we, we, we run these, these simulations and let our simulated self die rather than our real body mm. die, yeah. you, you know. And so, but that, but that then, that's the power of these models. But then you can see why letting go of models can be terrifying. The models are our security blanket. That's how we avoid the bear. That's how we avoid all these, these things happening that, that, are, that we don't want to have happen. So in meditation, when we let go of all of our models, we're letting go of what this has been all about. And so it's terrifying. But on the other hand, it's exhilarating because we then are opening ourselves up to a new level of conceptual system and maybe a new level right. of, of but, mind. But also think of it like <clears throat> everything in the mind 
belongs to the horizontal reality, which is survival and procreation for the life form. And that's fine. When you move into meditation, the true like state of meditation, it is vertical. So it's basically saying that my horizontal life is not relevant for meditation. It's moving into a different state. And yes, like how far you can go up the elevator uh, is decided by how much you are holding on to the horizontal. Uh, so the more let go of, the, the, the higher you can go. But it's basically just recognizing that, oh, okay, different formats. So it's let, letting go does not have to be scary. So recognizing that, yeah, it's relevant for the horizontal survival. It's completely irrelevant for vertical expansion. And the premise of vertical expansion is to let go. Uh, and it's basically just like in your home, you know, when you go from the kitchen to the living room, it's not like you let go of the kitchen. It will still be there. You don't have to like demolish it. It's still there. It's just like you go into the living room. And it's like that. It's just part of exploring consciousness is understanding that we have many rooms. You know, we, we have many different positions, many, many different points, you know, f through which we can experience. A and exploring consciousness in that way uh, means that you, over time, will feel less invested in any of them. You just understand, oh, the different position, different approaches, different levels, and they're all valid. And you just get to understand what, you know, how are these different points in different like spaces specialized? And just like the, the kitchen, you know, um, you prepare food and you maybe eat like the living room, not so much. So it's like understanding the different states of consciousness uh, as well as the different levels. So... We learn to be completely relaxed and saying, okay, letting go of something does not mean that we lose it. It simply means that we go from one state to another and we'll still be there when we get back. Uh, so we can be completely relaxed in, in exploring the different types of consciousness that is kind of within the kind of a bigger consciousness that we are as soul. And... Um, but meditational practices to me is so important because for most humans, it's the only time they can get into a more vertical position because you have to let go of the horizontal reality. And parts of what's happening in meditation is that you, stim you simply do not stimulate you know, the horizontal mind. And that's why it goes quiet. But you learn over time, I'm sure you've also experienced this, that the time it takes to go into deep meditation it's shorter and shorter because you have less resistance and basically your brain has figured out how to kind of tune in. Um, when, it, when it comes to really deep meditation, for many people, it can take years of practice. And, you know, you go to your, a retreat center and maybe you'll sit in meditation for, for days and then you will get to that deep um, level of meditation. Over the years, you may learn to go to that same deep place within a minute because you've kind of figured out how to tune in. And <clears throat> exactly. it's simply because you let go of more quicker. So you're able to move right. into that vertical position, accept that reality, not as a reality of having to let go of stuff, but gaining access to higher level of consciousness. So it becomes the opposite. Instead of losing, it's gaining. So... Also, the human mind starts to relate to it. So, uh, therefore, you will kind of gravitate towards it instead of kind of struggling. Mm. Exactly. Yeah, and that, that has been my experience is that you, you know, it, the, there's more and more an opening up to the process and less, less fear. But the, the fears that I face are, are deeper and then I let them go. It's, 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 it's an interesting thing, but the, yeah, but... What used to take a long, I would say that the amount of transformation that happens to me in just a few minutes now is, is probably more than for many, many hours uh, years exactly. ago. I mean, it, it, you, you learn the, what, there's one metaphor that I've, I've found interesting and useful in thinking about this meditation process, and it's metamorphosis. And, you know, when we think about metamorphosis, we think about this lowly, caterpillar being transformed into this beautiful butterfly and it sounds oh wow that's wonderful i mean that that sounds lovely and 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 delightful and and 
But when you actually study what's happening in, in the chrysalis, the, the immune cells of the caterpillar go to war with the cells that are responsible for the transformation into a butterfly and they kill them as much as they can. And so it's the, 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 the body of the caterpillar is not going nicely into that dark night. It, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not going there. It's fighting to, it views the transformation as an enemy uh, that has got to fight to the death. And so it's only when the immune system gets overwhelmed that then the process begins. But, but notice what happens. The, the, the structure of the body of the caterpillar liquefies everything that it knew dissolves. Now there, there's a point of view in which you can say that, that, that can't be pleasant, right? I mean, everything that you knew <laughs> dissolves and, but, but then it gets transformed into wings and a proboscis and, and, uh, a body that can do things that a caterpillar could never do. And it, it, it strikes me that that may be a good metaphor for each new stage that we go through in the spiritual process, that there's always today's butterfly, well, um, was yesterday's caterpillar yeah. and is, is, and, and will you know, I'll have to transform once again in a way that I will initially resist but then eventually I will come to terms and, and go forward with it. Just like every new grade you went through in school, it was sort of like, oh, I got to learn this. And then you, you go, okay, okay, I'll learn it. And then, well, okay, that wasn't that, that hard. And oh, that was now, now it's sort of fun. And so yeah. we sort of go through this process. But there is the, I agree with you, there's this meta learning mm -hmm. where we can sort of learn at a meta level, hey, you know, maybe don't fight so much at the beginning, right? Just sort of learn to just go with yes. it and recognize that. Everything that you're holding on to, um, you're going to have to let go of it anyway. Exactly. So you know, let yes. go of it. And that, that includes dogmatism and, and everything, but 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 also just your worldview, mm -hmm. how you see things. Can I let let go of, of yeah. that? One, one, one interesting okay. thing is that you know often people believe that we really can't learn from other people's experience. We can, but it requires a more mature level of consciousness. And this is also, you know, part of how we can work with collective consciousness is that if we think of we, we always belong to different levels of collective consciousness. So all experience becomes part of this great body as well that we are part of. And when we expand, mm -hmm. we get more access to that full body. And it's just like, you know, as an adult, uh, we might be able to kind of look at what other people do and what they go through and we we'll recognize the process and we can learn from it as if um, it were our own experiences. And it's that, you know, we get less resistance. And, and, yes. and back to um, the mathematics yes. in unfoldment, uh, as I talked about, with a caterpillar, it's basically that, you know, the resistance doesn't matter. It is, it will unfold because that is nature and it's pulling it forward. The transformation is not optional. And that, that's a thing with our own growth and our own transformations. They're not optional. And I tell people because often in spirituality, um, one has this focus on growth as almost, it becomes an obsession. And it often comes from mm -hmm. more uh, religious thinking that that we should because you know we're sinners and all that. If we put that aside and understand that if even if we sit still, life will unfold you, because just like the caterpillar, you have no option. It is happening. You are being unfolded. The thing is that that right. happens for as long as you have resistance. At some point, right. your level of awakening will be on par with the level of unfoldment, you understand? So that you actively are part of those transformational movements without resistance, and then you move on. So that you are ahead of the transformational processes. You, you run towards them. And yes, instead of resisting when something happens, you get it immediately, and you know where you're going to end up.
is like life is showing you something and okay i know i'm going to lose that 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 that's so a go done move on because you don't even <laughs> try to resist because you know you will always lose there is no you know there's no choice it's not optional it will happen it can happen you know you kicking and screaming or you can go voluntarily or you right. can proactively run towards it and that's right. when the fun happens because when you are ahead exactly. of your transformations you know it, it means that you get access to that consciousness before it manifests you get access to the principles so that you don't have to move through experience when that happens manifestation goes from being products of resistance to being expressions of consciousness and this is in many traditions one explains this it's it a whole it, it changes everything because it means that you can now actively use your existence in the different dimensions as playrooms and uh, uh, laboratories where you can actively perform experiments because your mind and consciousness is ahead of manifestation. So it means that you are ahead of the mathematics. So you can then use mathematics to test out actively in full awareness. And you can trace it, you can see it happening because your mind is before manifestation. So everything happens after. So you can see the, the consequence, you can trace it, you can learn more effectively. You don't have to live through it the way you do in the low consciousness because you're always behind, because you're in resistance. Right. And that means that things happen and then you react. As long as you react, you will be in the horizontal. So basically that transformation of, of consciousness means that you actively can use existence to explore and you manifest based on what you want to explore and you can test out the different aspects of your own consciousness in dialogue with life and this is to me like a huge kind of um watershed uh you know a uh, place or a stage in one spiritual development where one goes from like kind of lagging behind and therefore being reactive because if you look at the human life or most life forms, they're only reactive. Evolution is based on different life forms walking around, reacting to things, reacting to each other. And if you look at human interactions, it's mostly exclusive reaction based. And this is the horizontal part where all development happens passively because you don't have the awareness. So things have to happen to you and then you react based on your programmings and then you figure out, oh, my programmings are not, you know, enough for this situation. So I have to adapt. It's all forced. It's all based on the necessity of survival. So that happens when you are behind that kind of point. Uh, so the as you grow out of resistance, you know, as I said, the, the fun starts when you start in conscious to move ahead of of that kind of like line of manifestation it changes everything and to me this is where i also try to bring people uh into that space where one can be aware of things before they happen and you can see them happen you can play with them and you can learn even more it means you can uh get to that part of understanding the spiritual principles even faster because in resistance, you're too busy reacting to stuff and feeling sorry for yourself and trying to adapt to that. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that happens. I, I, I see in meditation that, that the resistance over the years has diminished and this more willingness to, instead of fighting what is, to explore what is and let it be my teacher as opposed to saying, why do I have to deal with mm -hmm. this? Instead, be going saying, what, what can I learn in this? And, and how can I get ahead in, in, in learning on this? And so it's much more fun and it's much mm -hmm. less painful um, instead of fighting. It's like you, you see little kids, you know, three-year-olds, four-year-olds, they spend a lot of time mm -hmm. crying and, and, and bawling about stuff. And, 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 and you realize, boy, you, you know, I wish I could just tell you that, that you're just giving yourself a lot of unnecessary misery and uh, ju just go with it. And, and, and we, we eventually learn it. You know, we learn to to go with it, mm -hmm. most of us. Um, but then in, in the spiritual, you know, in meditation, it's a, it's a new level of it because now letting go of thoughts 
is is a uh, is a much much deeper level of letting go of, of security. Mm -hmm. But but absolutely, it it it, it then becomes um, a very exhilarating process. And I think when we look at science in this science right now. My colleagues are, are brilliant. I love them. We, we have a good time together. But there's mm -hmm. resistance to letting go of physicalism. Yeah. Serious resistance, and my my take is that you know if I could just get a bunch of my my colleagues, um, many of them who have IQs that I can't even understand, right? They're just hmm. brilliant, brilliant people. They could run circles around me on the on the work that I'm doing. They could run circles around me. The only reason they're not is because they're still stuck exactly. in physicalism. But if they, they, if they caught the vision, they could so. Um, one reason why I focused you know, this last year, my my um, colleague Chaitan Prakash and I, some uh, other of our collaborators, Manish Singh and Chris Fields and others, um, published two two papers with theorems mm -hmm. about evolution. The, and the reason we're doing that is because it's theorems that say we don't see the truth. That are the only way that I know to wake them up is to get rid of the resistance. So that's that's what I've been doing is is saying. Can I mean I, I know how to break the resistance? If there's a theorem on the table, they can't ignore it. They may not like it, but that they can't ignore. Hmm, That's right. you know, if, if Hoffman is just talking, we don't see reality. Well, you know, he's you know he's getting old and soft, and you know who knows. But if he's got a theorem on the table, okay, you know, there's no more about Hoffman being old and soft. It's now, what does this mathematics really say? And so that's why I focused on that. But I think once the scientists. And, and I mean, I, as I said, I've been around science, people who are so smart, I have no idea how smart they are. I mean, the, once we get those people working on this, you know, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy what comes out. It's going to be so much fun. It, 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 it's, so it's just the, the resistance is the issue. It's not how smart mm. these people are. It's using their talents to explore where they didn't know they could explore, which is beyond space yeah. and time. And that's going to be ex extremely powerful. And, you know, once we start doing that, um, we're going to be able to reverse engineer space time. Yeah. It's not the reality. It's yeah. just a headset. And once we have this mathematical model from consciousness, the dynamics of consciousness through the amplitude hedron, say, into space time, we can reverse engineer it. That means that technologies are going to open mm. up to us that will make all of modern technology seem yes, trivial. Absolutely. We will be able to play with the actual structure of space time itself. Um, so, so it's going to be a Pandora's box. I mean, the, the potential power that's going to open up to us is, is, is mm. astonishing. Um, and we'll have to be careful with that, with that power. I think that that's for humans. That's the, um, uh, you know, uh, the biggest challenge, I think, is that humans are simply not intelligent enough. And there are still, like, as long as a life form is still mainly reacting, uh, right. Right. they are self-centered and they're focused on survival and they're not able to think bigger because to really, like, think beyond oneself, one needs to be more in the vertical, so when people are in that low state where they're mostly reacting, they don't think consequences. They they don't understand them. They don't want to deal with them because, you know, they just react to their own chemicals and that's it. And they don't care. And I think th this is where humans are at this point. And it's, um, you know, it's normally one would say that a life form reaching this level of technology will self-destruct because we're simply not smart enough. I think also medical sciences will develop this century and next uh, to maybe modify our genetics uh, so that we are a little smarter and a little bit more adapted to um, our own kind of environment, our own civilization, because evolution is simply not going fast enough. And uh, I think, you know, when that distance um, between the evolution of society and the evolution of our human bodies, when that's, you know, when that becomes a huge void, self-destruction is inevitable. So I think we'll have to figure out how to modify 
humans to be more adapted to a more advanced civilizations because when we look at you know the state of human affairs at this point it's not promising <laughs> right yeah it's it's um well if i just put on you know a particular hat the, the evolutionary hmm. theorist hat for a moment um from an evolutionary psychology point of view uh it's 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 interesting to ask why we evolved the ability to think at all hmm. and reason and there's some, some very interesting work by um dan sperber and hmm. hugo mercier um where they 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 have a book called the enigma of reason reason the enigma of reason i highly recommend it and they argue that we evolved reason and again I, I'm, I'm not saying this is the final answer but it's the best answer science has so far in terms of an evolutionary point of view on this we evolved reason not in search of truth you know as a way as a tool for finding the truth but as a tool of social hmm. persuasion we're a social yeah. species and you know we we're not that fast we're not that strong a single one of us can't bring down a woolly mammoth but as a group we could bring down the woolly mammoth but we have to yes. coordinate and so i've got my idea about how to bring it down you have your idea if i need to persuade you about my idea you're trying to persuade me about mm -hmm. your idea so, so logic and reason evolved not in service of truth but in service of social persuasion yes. and one of the so so and we see that in politics mm -hmm. and religion and in our inter everyday interactions um people are arguing in a way that you realize oh they're not actually looking for right. the truth here they're, they're just trying to make me understand and believe what they believe yeah. already that that's that's what's going on and so we have what, what scientists call a confirmation bias we look for evidence that confirms what we already absolutely think is true and so that's and that's why when we're reasoning uh, you know in the logical in, in a social situation when you're dealing with other people one-on-one -on -one, that's when you have your best ideas and and yeah. logic comes out of you really really easily so often yeah. i get my best research done when i'm with a bunch of my mm. team my research team and we're talking because that was from an evolutionary point of view that was the natural environment in which logic and reason mm. evolved it, it involved as a social tool not not an individual einstein sitting by himself mm. alone well, i you know einstein could do that very few of us can can do it like yeah. einstein did on, on his own and alone and even einstein had that close friends that he you know a mathematician that he worked with and yeah. so forth um so so from that point of view you know it's it's interesting to think about logic and reason as as a tool but there's another really surprising and interesting thing about our intelligence and logical skill abilities from an evolutionary point of view that's counterintuitive mm -hmm. so um paleoanthropologists have been looking at the skulls of our mm. ancestors hominid ancestors and for several million years a couple million years they were slowly going up like an escalator up mm -hmm. in volume until about fifteen thousand yeah. years ago and then it's gone plummeting down it, what's remarkable perhaps about our species uh what makes us stand out is that we're the species whose brains are shrinking at the at the yeah. fastest pace of any species yes. on the planet and the the uh, that, so that's what the cranium volumes are, are, are telling us. This is just mm -hmm. the, the data that we get from digging up bodies and, and measuring their skulls. But but before I read this from John Hawkes is one of the paleoanthropologists doing this. But, but my study of evolutionary theory actually made me on my own predict that this would happen um, before I saw the paleoanthropology because 15,000 years ago, we, we'd gotten so smart that we invented agriculture. Mm -hmm. And when we invented agriculture, then we um, we got before we were hunter gatherers. We were in small exactly. small groups, and you had to do it all yourself, or yeah. you died. So there's a real strong selection pressure on you. You had to be physically robust, mentally yeah. robust, flexible, be able to deal with all sorts <laughs> of things. With agriculture now, we got a division of labor. Joe over here is doing the plants. Exactly. Now we need we have to have a standing army because people are going to come in and try to steal our crops. So we, now we have a standing army, but now we have so much food. Now, uh, you know, Joe can spend all of his time mm. doing the crops. Mary can start sewing. Exactly. You know, all this stuff. Bill can make shoes. So you get you yes. get a division of labor. You get a social yes. safety net. Now, when you get a social safety net, there are not as many 
tough selection pressures on the individual. Right now, I can be, I can have an IQ hmm. of seventy, and I can go to Trader Joe's and buy stuff and exactly. be just fine. Uh, and so, as a result, since there were not so much strong selection pressures on the individuals, people who were not quite as smart, not hmm. quite as robust, could survive exactly. and reproduce. And so, what you find is that the selection pressures go off, and so our mm -hmm. brains start shrinking in volume, and our bodies are yeah. less robust. So, if our great 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 grandfather from fifteen thousand years ago came by. And saw us, we would probably look like weak, uh, yes. dumb wimps. Absolutely, you know? and and yeah. and and it is very so, clear, as I said, because it's it's interesting to watch, kind of like throughout human history, that humans get dumber and dumber. And as I say, it is because, th like the better social structure we we have, the less we have to think. Uh, we can be passive. We are consumers of other people's ideas and creativity, and we just have to react to them. So we react a lot more than we used to. And if you look at many people today, all they do is react negatively because it's like it's about comfort. It's about, you know, it's it's not about really achieving anything. It's about complaining about what other people are not giving you. So it's it's we are getting dumber, but the way to turn that around, of course, is to go from being that um, reactive individual and waking up the, the vertical awareness so that we can start using life and we can explore <clears throat> because that, that's still a part of us. Uh, I think also like um, back to what you talked about first, uh, I, I talk a lot about uh, the, the human mind being extremely hierarchical and we develop thoughts and all of that to be able to um, convince others that we should kind of climb on the ladder because basically we cannot define our own place in the hierarchy. It's based on how other people see us and therefore we needed to convince other people based on the value system because first you have a value system and that produces a hierarchy. That's kind of both, that's the rules of the game and then you have the game and um, you cannot decide your own place in the hierarchy. So you have to convince and you have to then figure out based on the value system, what will, how we will score points. And if you score enough points, you will gravitate towards the top. And that's basically um, our complete strategies as, as humans, because again, you, you have that individual survival gatherer, all that, but in the social structure, it's it, survival is only by hierarchy. Because when you climb up the ladder, other people will provide for you. So it's the, it's, okay. it's the most uh, intelligent way um, of ensuring your own survival uh, by enslaving others. So, so you have to think and you have to use strategies. And the human mind still today is, is completely consumed by hierarchical thoughts and emotions and it's all about as a, the, the combination of value system and understanding of hierarchy and then placing yourself in it by trying to convince the world around you. And all human communication is hierarchical. The, 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 the reason why people communicate at all is to communicate hierarchical information and try to convince other people uh, in what they are worth and to, to kind of produce and man, manipulate uh, other people to give you that confirmation that will place you on the right shelf according to you you know uh, your own self-assessment so humans are still doing that it's just the rules of survival have changed from being kind of like productive work in higher in, uh, in 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 the world to be more of like a social uh, like structure-based uh, survival and our brains from my yeah. perspective like even more hierarchical now than we used to be but you you don't you you need more emotions. You need to be more triggered in order to figure out how to play the game of hierarchy. You, you don't need intelligence. So we've become a lot more kind of chemically based. People feel a lot more now than we used to, and we kind of think less because we we don't have to. And and I, I agree that this seems to be a lot of what's what's happening with with us. And so trying to understand spirituality at a deep level and the dynamics of spirituality that we've been talking about and then understand how that dynamics projects into our particular 
manifestation mm. or headset or, or particular virtual reality. And, and why then that looks like what well, we've been discussing, evo discuss discussing evolutionary psychology, right? So the principles of evolutionary psychology, some of them are, are not that flattering, right? I mean, we're, we're trying to, you know, what we've been saying is not very flattering about, about humans. So, so what I would like, you know, from a, a science and spirituality interaction would be to say, what are the deeper dynamics of mm -hmm. consciousness, in what you call the, the vertical level? That that presumably isn't so much about selfishness and in you know, as you mm -hmm. hierarchy as you've been saying, what how is it that when we project that deeper mathematical model of, of consciousness and this dynamics into yeah. our little VR headset of space and time, why does it then manifest or look like this kind of very unflattering kind of psychology that, that that's going on? So that that's going to be for me a really interesting, really important. Um, rigorous bit of science right. that we need to do. Yeah. Be, the be, be, basically, again, it's back to understanding resistance. And I explain this, you know, because existence in itself, we, we can in, in, in many ways just say that is love. It's the closest we can get to an understanding of isness. And I say the, the only way to study love is to study how you are blocking it because love mm -hmm. already is. And since you have no active experience of it, it's because you are blocking it. And then you have to study all the ways you're blocking it and figure out how to unblock because love is already there. So you, it's, it's, it's a waste of time trying to fill yourself with love when you don't have the capacity. When you, you already exist in that ocean, your experience reflects how you are blocking and this is why we often, like, the manifested life is in many ways a negative. It's based on the blockages. It's based on the resistance. And you interact with your mm -hmm. own uh, resistance and blockages so that you may dissolve them by understanding how to be in harmony. By living through your own blockages and the results and implications coming from your own resistance, you will gradually soften, you will get it, you will mature, and you will reach a state of less resistance where you allow more of what is instead of holding on to what you think it should be. So that that's the reason. So often, again, if you have a very strong intention of love in the vertical, that will amplify you know, your ways of studying how you're blocking it in the horizontal. Well, that, that makes sense. And I think that that could eventually be cashed out in a, a really yeah. precise way um, in, in, in a mathematical theory. I mean, one, one thing that comes to mind, it wouldn't be the whole story, but part of the story is that the, the mapping from the dynamics of consciousness and which say is the vertical, into space-time, the horizontal, is a projection. It's a many-to-one yeah. mapping. And so, in some sense, um, you're dealing in a much more limited world in the projection. In, yes. in, and so, there's this artifact of the projection that, that, that resources are limited. Information is limited. Everything mm -hmm. is limited. And so, that leads to this more ki kind of competitive kind of thing. It, right, in, in terms of evolution by natural selection, if there were unlimited resources, there would be no exactly. selection pressures. So, so the, you only get evolution by natural selection when there is limitations on, yes. on, on resources. Otherwise, so so it could be that. Um, so so now it's 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 very interesting for me to you know, ask as a scientist, how do we actually? These ideas are very tantalizing. They seem very promising. So we'd like to cash them out in precise mathematics. And is the result going to be that? Uh, well, I don't know how it's going to how it's going to come out, but it, it, it's going to be that somehow there's a dynamics that perhaps isn't limited in consciousness fundamentally, or or not mm -hmm. as limited, or projected down. Now it's highly yes. limited, but but it may be that it's the consciousnesses themselves which fundamentally aren't limited when they are forced to see things in a limited way. 
maybe then they act in ways that they wouldn't otherwise act, but then maybe that somehow feeds back in the vertical, what you call the vertical consciousness, to help help them learn something new about themselves. Yes. I, I, it's going to be fun. Right. To because work out if that you think of like in, in, in psychology, often what one refers to as blind spots, you, you know, it's basically you know, uh, character flaws or whatever that we're not aware of. Everyone else can see it, but we can't. So it's kind of that when like incarnation is simply the process of going into a limited reality, as a which is a specialized reality, because that's really what it is. The limitations are not interesting in themselves, is that it's specialized and a specialization is limited so that you can get an amplification of the resistance that you need to work on. And so um, so basically uh, for that to happen in vertical consciousness, you need to already be aware of that distance. We call it that the, the field of resistance, which is like you realize that, oh, there's another step. And the moment you kind of connect with that next step, that field of resistance will then be released and that will turn into manifestation. It's not like we work on everything at the same time because that's impossible. So it's this is why we refer to it as a journey because we, we, we take one step at the time. So that field of resistance, when, when that is being released, it turns into manifestation and it will be specialized manifestations. And it's the same thing, you know, in life. We have many different forms of incarnation. You know, we we have different roles. Uh, we we go into a different setting, different rooms in our own life, in ourselves, different manifestations, and you know, even objects can become extensions of ourselves, like a car, you know, or like object clothes, whatever we you know, we like becomes an extension of our own body, uh, and we we invest our own consciousness and perspective. Uh, for instance, in our car. You know, I, I love cars, so so I, I can identify with cars. And my, my cars then become an extension of my own incarnation. You know, and I experience myself differently in the car than I do outside of it. And with, you know, the, the car I sit in will kind of change me because it becomes also right. a body of my consciousness. So it's like, like that, and right. it's endless. This is part of the fractalization. You know, it's the the further you go, the more specialized the space becomes. Like a car is highly specialized, and yet it can do something with me and how I feel in a way I cannot mm -hmm. achieve any other way. And if I'm in life in general, I will not have those emotions. You know, I will not be able to access that state that I can get the acceleration. You know, from driving a fun car. So this is what it is about. It's all about specialization and any specialization has to be limited. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that, that makes sense at a very, very, very high level. And so I, I would, you know, love to cash that out um, in, in a, a precise way. I think that there's a lot there and um, that will working on that will really be um, illuminating both on the nature of what we're experiencing right now in right. space and time, and particularly illuminating in terms of deep principles about how consciousness works in the, in this vertical dimension. Right? So, I mean, we our ideas there as well could be refined. So I think it would be really uh, a really fun direction right. to go. Of uh, course, I have I have I do have to go now, and, and uh, but this has been a really a great yeah, conversation. I really enjoyed joining you. Really... And again, I, I, I really am so happy uh, that you're actually doing this work because science has to move forward. And at least you have realized that, you know, the wall in the Truman Show is indeed a wall. And it is important. And it is important that as many people of science as possible kind of come to that conclusion and they will because there is no option you know no matter what they do at some point they will discover it and a thing like then it's right. up to you when you first have discovered that this is true you have to go beyond it you yes. know and and now we yes. have the tools absolutely the science now has the tools i'm sure we'll get new tools but we we have tools we didn't have a few hundred years ago and so it's going to be exciting to yeah. see where we go.